we have a conversation with young Black artists making strides in the music industry. Joining us for this conversation is Carl Swagel. Kareem Kamasu, better known by his stage name, Carl Swagel, is a UK born recording artist currently based in Trinidad and Tobago. Though Kareem was born and raised in the UK, he is of Trinidadian and Nigerian heritage. Muhammad Muakil. Muhammad Abdul Kudus Muakil is the quintessential Trini, a melange of cultures, histories, and genes. Although he often wears the colors of and emblems of Rastafari, he is a practicing Muslim fluent in Arabic. DJ Honey Kalada is a female DJ born from Trinidad and Tobago who amplifies and plays the best Afrofusion sounds in the house, hip hop, R&B, soul, trap, flex, dance music, diasporic rhythm, soca, and dancehall. DJ Honey Kalada is the creator and host of a monthly video podcast called Afrobibe, celebrating the African diaspora through music and culture. She is the festival coordinator for Africa Flim, Trinidad and Tobago. And we have the conversation lead, Charlton Alfonso. He is a young multi-instrumentalist, having achieved proficiency on the steel band, electric bass guitar, as well as the drum set. Alfonso has proven his music capabilities, not only through his performance, but his composition and arranging capabilities. Possessing a lot of potential and natural talent, Charlton has been culturally involved in the arts from the early age of four. Wow, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Good afternoon. See everyone here. Good afternoon. Yes, yes. So, watching that video uh, and gave me goosebumps, you know, once again. And, um, so one statement that really stood out to me is that I is we and we is power. Yeah. And that, and that felt super important to me, especially today as we are discussing, you know, our music as forms of black empowerment. Mm -hmm. Right. And that really hammered home the, the, the fact to me that, you know, we're all connected and we really need to act accordingly in, yeah. this, in this industry. You know, it's not, artists against artists, so it shouldn't be artists against artists. Mm -hmm. So today we'll be discussing, and again, I'm your host, Jonathan Alfonso, and we have DJ Honey Kalana, Kaz Fuego, and Mohammed Mo. I Come on. We have an insane panel here, and I think the discussion is really something to, to witness. So anybody that's not on the live, I don't know what I don't know what to tell you again. Listen. So, yeah. so the importance of music as a means for black empowerment. Mm -hmm. I want to get your all of your takes on do you see your music as a form of protest? Um absolutely in certain senses. Um not not like every record for me, but nearly every other record I somewhat feel like it is a protest or somewhat showing a message that people kind of want to ignore, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, especially with the music that I've been making recent, recently, like it's been more that direction, I guess. So definitely, definitely. Yeah, I could definitely add to that. Like, I mean, if you think about like what it did, and what music represents, also what a protest represents, right? It, it's like, a, it, it's almost like a catalyst for change, right? And music has always been that. And it's always about, not always, but it's been about um, resistance, you know? It's been about policy. It's been about social change. And you hear it all the time. I mean, just think about Mali, right? And that is the most famous example I could give um, legal that, you know, um, who shot the sheriff, war. You could think it's, there's so many examples um, that, that, that convey music as a form of protest, you know, and it's not just in our um, part of the, the world. I mean, you have it even in Africa, if you think about continental music from Africa now, you know, you have genres of music that are coming up that were born out of um, struggle, were born out of, you know, using lyrics as a way to um, 
yeah, as a way to, you know, describe the, the describe the hardships and describe, you know, issues with governments, issues with social issues, like, you know, so it's, I, I definitely see music as a form of protest. I think, you know, from way back in the day, especially to today, it, it's absolutely a form of protest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, music has a way to really ask permission to make you feel that way. That's the real amazing thing about music. You could be sitting down somewhere and you're in a real good mood and all of a sudden a real sad song started to play and your emotions started to go all over the place. You and your feels, and you wasn't even thinking about that. You know, you could be sitting somewhere and, and get up, stand up, start to play or something like that and you in the next, in the next zone. And um, for me, beyond just the protesting of against the system or whatever, music and art on a whole is a kind of protest to say, well, I am alive. Like I, me mm -hmm. na, me one. Me who don't dress how all it is dressed. Me who don't want to wear my hair how it is wear all their hair. Me who don't talk like all they do the same food though. Me who like things how I like them. Me who want to see the world how I want to see it. Yeah, I making these things here that nobody else do make, my boy. And to me, that's 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 such a big form of the protest too. Now, because for me, I feel like from the time you come out, your mother, woman, and sell a ball and protest already. Like yeah, you know, and I go and submit to the way the world is. So definitely, yeah. art is art and music is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With the mm -hmm. music I play as a DJ, right? Like I would say I would play music as a way of, you know, like my own rebellion, right? So I I, I just want to play black music, right? Like I, I don't want to play anything other than and and I, and there's a much deeper reason for that. And I think this is this is a big part of it. So that kind of pulls me to my next question, right? In regards to what Mohammed said, you know, music has a way of not asking your permission mm -hmm. to, to tell you how to would you say as artists yourselves, right? And especially you, DJ Honey, as you now said, you know, you, where you are as a DJ, you want to play what you want to play. Do you think, or would you say you're inspired by current events? Or no. Uh, yes. Yes, I know. I am inspired by current events. However, I've always been, there's always been this, what, how do I explain this? There's there's always been this double consciousness for me. So like I would play music that represents me as a person, like my personality, what my values, my beliefs, um, mm -hmm. as well as you know playing music that is also trendy, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So there is a balance for me. Um, I don't know if that, I answered your question. Yeah, I get, I get. <laughs> so it kind of pulls me. To ask, does music need to always be some form of protest? Not all the time, no, I don't think so. Because I mean, even though I'm playing songs that are, um, I guess you could call it Afro pop, I, a lot of the lyrics deal with heartbreak and love. I mean, I guess they could be protesting their own relationships there, right? But Yo, no, bl yes, black it, people you know. being happy and dancing, that real protest there for me. Right. <laughs> right. Because we because oftentimes like I tell people all the time, right? When we born, most of us when we born, the trajectory is down, what don't know. Like mm -hmm. you're yeah. trying to not end up on the streets. Like no, no joke. You're trying to not end up by like one of your brethren you know, who you know in jail or on the streets or whatever. So when we create music that's happy and music that's talking about love. If if men who look like me and cars talking about love, that's big protest. That's to me, that's that's big rebellion. You know I mean, what I mean? That's because all kind of I yeah. about to No. Hold on, I didn't, cause I didn't catch that. I think it glitched for a second. I, I see that's kind of all that is be talking about too sometimes, now, you know what I mean? Mm. Of course. <laughs> so, yeah. What? I, mean, <laughs> I mean, you have to now, but like, that's the kind of person I am too now. Like, I kind of like to focus on the more positive things in life. Mm. That love is a really positive thing. So, when you listen to my songs, regardless of what direction I go with it sonically, there's always going to be some kind of emotion towards love or speaking about love. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, like, and that is definitely a protest for sure. I, for sure. I think that's important, especially just back to the topic of form of black empowerment, because if there's one people that holistically has never received any large amount of love. Yeah. Us. So I, I think by as you said with your music, singing about love, and as Muhammad said, 
men like that look like us singing about love and you're singing about love it is a form of protest i think that yep. really yeah yeah man so so mr love as you're singing about <laughs> love, where you take your your main inspiration um I feel like I find my main inspiration in trying a situation in life. Um, when I say that, I find inspiration in knowing that I have a talent that once I use the correct way, I could change how my life is right now. And that's not saying that my life, how it is right now, is bad enough. It's just saying that in life as people, to really use every breath that we have, we had to kind of level up each time. That should be the focus. As he said, for, for mainly for black people, the trajectory is downwards now. So, yeah, like knowing that I have a talent and I could put songs and people like them and they feel a certain way towards them. Um, knowing that I could change my situation with that does really motivate me. You know, you know what I mean? Like family, you know what I mean? My mother, these kind of people. It's more, it's more away from music than music itself. You understand? So, yeah. So, DJ Honey, mm -hmm. as a DJ, mm -hmm. right, would you say the particular beats that you use to reflect, you know, your own identity and your inspiration or where it draws from? If I would use it as a way to, to what? Sorry, can you say that again? Are there particular beats? Oh, yeah particular beats that you use to reflect your identity and your inspiration tell us yeah about your okay so so like most of the music that I'm, I'm not not only drawn to but most of the music that I would listen to would be I guess I would categorize it as like afro pop music which is pretty much african popular music um which is what we hear which which is what we're hearing now a lot of afro beats but it's not just afro beats um, there are a lot of subgenres within Afro pop that we don't really um, get to. Uh, we don't really get to like explore because of what's taken over the airwaves currently in terms of mainstream. So, like a lot of these subgenres in African popular music are inspired by influences such as jazz, hip hop, reggae. So, you know, is is a lot of that. Even soca, calypso, zouk. You know, so I I think I think it's those beats definitely represent who I am, where I'm from, um, and where I would like to be. Um, so yeah, you know, and, and they all, and when you think about like all of these genres that influence Afropop music, it, it is rooted in some sort of history with Blackness and Black culture. And I'm very proud of it. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm okay. sure that. How would you say if you're Black consciousness, you know, your style, how would you describe your style? You know, where, what con black consciousness means to you as a musician? Black consciousness for me is more about, um, I mean, I, I could go back to the, the, the foundation of what black, con the black consciousness movement, right? Like, you know, I'm thinking about it as a way of life, as an attitude. So mm -hmm. I, I, I have not deviated from that in terms of, black consciousness for me being a way of life and an attitude and there are certain markers of that for me um like music like you know sometimes I would and not just not just a particular way of dressing because I've never really owned any Ankara prints before you know a couple of years ago but you know all that is part of the trend all part of all, all that's part of the style so yeah I suppose if there was a way for me to represent that outwardly yeah, but it's not something that I'm that I feel like you know I have to wear my hair like you know in a fro or I have to wear a dashiki to be black conscious. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like I always tell people like my personality. I feel like I could be a walking contradiction sometimes because there are times where I will you know kind of like lean towards a more Eurocentric look per se, but it still doesn't take away from the fact that I am. Afrocentric in the sense of, you know, a lot of what guides me is African culture, African history, African values, beliefs, you know, collectiveness, that sort of thing. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
definitely. Um, yeah. Obed, would you say your style, right, kind of going with what, what DJ Honey was saying, was your style always about Black consciousness or was there any, like, specific event that occurred in your life that kind of changed your trajectory in terms of your sound and your style and, you know? I mean, I have pictures of, of my mom and my dad protesting the apartheid movement in mm -hmm. South Africa, like, and that's when I now come into the world. So I came into the world with an understanding that um, we were no less than anybody, mm -hmm. but that there was a fight for us to, to, me, to, to achieve that equality across all platforms. Mm -hmm. So to be black conscious is to begin with that thought that, that you are no less and that there were times in civilization where the civilization that we came from were greater than the ones that subdued us or attempted to us, I should say, <laughs> to subdue right. us, because here we are, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so I think my, my, my central focus has always been a sense of justice, leaning towards uh, justice for, for Black people, right? Colored people, of the people who are, yeah, who have traditionally been marginalized in that way. Um, and it has informed for me every single thing that I've done. Uh, and in some ways, I can't understand people who that do inform everything that you do, right? Because the reality of the world that we live in is that, like I said before, the trajectory for most of us when we're born is down. And that, that's not because of anything other than history. That's mm -hmm. not because of anything other than, you know, the way that the world would like to see itself. The world essentially is run by a small group of white men. And once we have that understanding in our brain and we know that that can't remain that way forever and ever, amen, then everything we do in a way is about rebalancing, you know, the way we look at our women, the way we look at ourselves, the way we look at our children, how we travel through the world as black people. And, you know, for those of us who are men, how we travel through the world with that knowledge, that constant knowledge as black men. Mm -hmm. So if I'm in a taxi with a black woman, or if I'm in a taxi with women in general, um, how do I carry myself even in that situation? That is black consciousness. If I'm walking next to somebody in the road, how do I carry myself? That is black consciousness. You know, if I choose to buy clothes where I spend my money, that is black consciousness. What I choose to eat where I buy it from, that is black consciousness. You know, it's not any one single decision, but it is the awareness of who we are, where we are, and what we have to do. Right. Again, some really great points. And you know, you said a lot of things there that you mentioned rebalancing, right? Mm -hmm. And I think pulling that back to, because you said the world is really run by a small group of white men. And when you mentioned rebalancing, that kind of made me start thinking on a local level, right? And if I'm looking specifically at, at, at you three artists, right? When, we take a, when I think of rebalancing, I started thinking of local content. And I, in my opinion, I don't think, speaking from the panel here, I don't think the three of you all are as big as you should be. You know, I don't think a lot of artists in Trinidad are as big as we should be. And goes back to kind of what DJ Honey said too with the, with the control of the airwaves and what is really coming out and what is really played. So that kind of pulls me to local content right with regards to what you all put out and you all produce with your how you're influenced as, as, as black conscious people right do you think the majority has a lack of appreciation for local content of this nature i'll i'll give you a... go ahead honey no, 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 you go, you go first. I can, um... <laughs> I'll give you an example of something that happened to us, right? A real tangible example. In 2013, there was a concert called the Live Concert, right? Mm -hmm. um, there was a, a girl who had cancer and she had to raise funds, whatever, and it ended up being this really big concert in, in, in O2 Park, right? Um, certain big players in the industry decided that they wanted, um, they wanted us to be a major part of it. Mm -hmm. And they took one of our slowest songs, a song called Jerusalem, they play Jerusalem on the radio every day, maybe four, five, six times an hour mm -hmm. for the ads, right? Every single day. Our slowest 
most poetic song, one of them. Yeah. By the time we got there on the night, 3,500 young Trinidadians were singing Jerusalem word for word. Yeah. yeah. Right? So there's a thing where sometimes as, as quote-unquote non-mainstream artists, we kind of feel like, oh, I wonder if my work is good enough. I wonder. And, and, and it is not about any other. What's being, what's being touted now as great or whatever is simply a matter of repetition and what's put into people's minds and what's put in their face over and over and over and over. Like, it don't matter where it is, you know. I'm telling you, like, it doesn't matter what it is. People are hungry, right? And if somebody tell you, it only ask Starbucks, you know, it only ask Skittles, you know, it only ask Skittles. After yeah. a while, you're going to eat them Skittles, you know, and after a while, your brain going to find a way to say, yo, this is the best thing, right? Because if all yeah. you have is Skittles, then we eat in Skittles, dog. We glorify in Skittles. Skittles is the most amazing thing. And, and the danger is that after one or two generations, it become a Skittles culture. And the people yeah. who used to eat yam and thing, them look, they're looking like them crazy boy. Rice? Where's oh, rice? Yeah. yeah. What's rice, dog? What are you talking about? My bones going to break. What are, you, what are you telling me? You know what I mean? But yeah. it's, for, it's always for us to understand that the world is cyclical and it always comes back. It always finds its way back around. Mm. You see, any, anytime you have that kind of imbalance, it can't last forever now, boy, because the, the world just is about balance. You know? 100%. So here how I feel about, this is how I feel about this this that question right because and it, it, for me and this is something that I repeat over and over and, and also my experience as a DJ I'm I'm not you know no celebrity DJ I'm not even a very well known DJ right but based on based on the experience that I've had over the last two years right is people would I would get emails um, where local artists would send me their songs. I would listen to these songs and there are some really good ones that I think should be on radio. However, it's not. And the same thing Mohammed said is like, because you, because DJs, and I think DJs also have a huge responsibility here in setting, well, okay, I don't want to get all theoretical, right? But in setting the agenda for what we think as consumers of culture, what's important and what's not important. So like Mohammed say, if you hear, Jerusalem on the radio a hundred times and you're not hearing the local song played not even once unless you pass some big money because that's what happens let's be real right unless you pass money to get your song played nobody's gonna hear it if they hear it once okay but you know the amount of the the and what you hear on radio is not necessarily good music but because you hear it over and over and over and over and over again you think that it's good music so familiarity then sets into play and then you think okay because I'm familiar with this song it's a good song but that's not necessarily the case so I don't think that we are uh, I think it's not by choice that we think that foreign music or whatever we hear is good music better than the local music I think that we're just not being exposed to it I think DJs have a big responsibility to play music that is local music um, and then a lot of the times you find yourself comparing the local music to the foreign music and then you're like, oh, no, nah, yeah, that's not really hitting as hard as the foreign song because maybe it have a little too much Caribbean roots, a little too, it's sung a little too trendy. You know what I mean? It could be any little thing. So because, because of all of this agenda setting, which is, which is what's happening by the radio stations, by, you know, so you, you seem to think that is good content when it really... I mean, it could be good, right? But there's also local content out there that's just as good that could compete with Jerusalem if we even give ourselves the chance just to hear it. And I, and I don't think that happens enough. I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you a real tangible example for me, right? Mm -hmm. Skilly Bang and Boy Boy. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I don't even think I need to say anything more. Skilly Bang and Boy Boy. Really? Right? The only difference is obviously that Boy, Skilly Bang is coming from a culture where he's completely backed by Jamaican culture and is fully authentic in that way. And Boy Boy, and they're yep. still kind of borrowing, right? That's the only difference. Yep. But in terms of skill level and whatever, there's no reason why we shouldn't be re. I mean, I mean, and I guess we re we read Boy Boy still, eh? but mm -hmm. Boy Boy still, you know, he we we haven't rated him to the point where where Rihanna noticing him. You know, what I mean, we haven't rated Boy Boy to that point or whoever. And we it's almost as though. We wait until somebody rate them, even though they get a real rate, eh? like the street rate these people, mm -hmm. but it rate them in a way where within a year or two, you could still then just not hear from them. 
You know what I mean? Because right to the point where that's kind of the question where why do you think we look outside of our country for greatness? Because that same example you use, like I love Trinidad, as, as they call it, Trinidad. Love boy boy. But to the point where, as I'm in Jamaica now, everywhere I go, everywhere, I show to hair skinny men. Certain. Mm -hmm. Any club, any street, the whole of Kingston, as you, wherever you pass, your hair in skinny bang. Yeah. Your hair skinny bang, your hair in coffee, your hair in chronic, your hair in your hair in golf. Now, your hair in your people, right? And everybody mm -hmm. plays songs. And it's not to say it's just young people playing it, right? As compared to when I was home. The only people you're really seeing playing, you know, the Trinity Bad artists, the Boy Boy, the K Lion, the, the yeah. cool thing is the younger generation, right? The older generation, they, they don't really listen to it or they're saying that as they just brush it off, right? Yeah. And, and even, even the, some of the older heads, the older head artists kind of brush yeah. it off what is coming up. So, my I want to know, right? I want to get your thoughts on this crab in a barrel syndrome, right? With mm -hmm. regard to us less mainstream artists, right? How do we combat or how do we compete on, even if not saying we will compete, how do we get in to that mainstream circle or that mainstream market to, to get the music out there, to really get people listening because I think the local the local people they want new music they want to hear what we have to say but as you said if they didn't get any skittles they will, then they will not eat the skittles yeah. so how do yeah. you how do you think we, we need to combat this this fight I, I think I have a situation of like there needs to be relentless support for what's happening in Trinidad musically you know? like there needs to be support for, yeah, we're talking about the boy boys and the training bad scene, but I feel in order to really get, as you say, people like Rihanna to know about certain artists, it needs to be a situation where, for one, there's a variety of artists that are getting pushed on that level, mm -hmm. right? Um, a mixture of sounds too. So it's just like in, in, in Africa too, as you're saying, there's Afro beats, there's Afro swing, there's Afro fusion, there's R&B, Afro, like, and all of what happens is every category of genre or whatever supports the other now, regardless if it's the smallest type of support, but what I feel happens a lot here with artists to themselves, not just the people, is that we've only now come to a bigger space of togetherness in a while, like, I believe in it, from what I see, like, yeah, they would have groups of people that are together, but there needs to be like trainees need to be open with supporting somebody doing something different from mm -hmm. where they are and mm -hmm. not try to, well, it's not something like this or well, it like picking it apart now has made so many artists that I know and I show Muhammad no stop music because there's always some level or quality level or whatever level that they want to be at when genuinely music is once it sounds good and it feels good there shouldn't be no stipulations on it for it to get love and mm -hmm. also as you see people in charge the, the programming that they put in the music it can't be what it's, it's very selective now mm -hmm. that's why we run into the problem now but because it's very selective we'll play okay we'll play all truly bad artists and we will we as the radio all that support in local, but mm -hmm. not knowing that it has about 17 different types of artists doing different types of music, that once we push all of these musics, more ears, more fans, more people with loyal fan bases in the country, that are happen. But if, when I put on the radio, I could only hear one genre from the country, and then these mm -hmm. people in this genre pertaining to fans that are already good, they're already in a space of where they could build now. You know what I mean? Like, they don't necessarily need this amount of play that you want or you give them. But mm -hmm. there's other artists that do need it and not get any chance because maybe the beat doesn't sound like what they used to. Like, there's a lot of what they used to type of energy I get now. 
right. even with my records, like I, I do a lot of um, Afro influence music only as of recent, probably, probably like last two years, I guess. Um, and that's just mainly because my dad, who's Nigerian, came to Trinidad for the first time ever. And he was like, yo, you need to, like, I've been listening to your songs, but I'm not really hearing where you're from. I'm not really feeling like you, it sounds like you're making dope songs, but you're not really being yourself with the songs. Mm. You understand? It, it kind of feels like you're trying to copy something. And that kind of stuck with me and that changed my view on how I make music. And sometimes I'll play records for people and they wouldn't understand it. But then what I might do, I might play this for somebody in Cali or San Francisco and they going crazy. You understand what I'm saying? Like they trying to call me, they trying to get emails. So it's all about like what they used to hearing. We used to hearing the five top best hip hop songs and we used to hearing that. So if you're not doing that, we can't like, I don't know how, how to put it in now. And that shouldn't be the thing now. Right. So yeah, it's just I, like, I lend support is when we start having those support. I think with that knowledge too, it is on the, the, the so-called non-mainstream artists to understand where they where they stand right mm -hmm. if you if your if your goal and your focus in your brain is trying to get played on terrestrial radio with trinidad you're going to frustrate mm -hmm. yourself a million different ways now boy and no, i think i think observing cars and a couple of the other artists around men like jimmy men like you know i would even say free because i think that from 100%. the very beginning we followed we yeah. followed a kind of a pattern that was laid down for us by people like Tree Canal, right? Where mm -hmm. you create a counterculture. So right. there's a there's a very, very, very cool ass counterculture that mm -hmm. exists that a lot of the right. a lot of the quote unquote um mainstream and stuff, they don't even have any clue, but it defines a lot, right? right. And right. I think the 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 little step is as a matter of fact, I really want to speak for myself. The little step for, for us has been, I just kind of got fed up of saying, yo, them singing shit. And I literally just went, I can do that. No, I don't want to exist in that space 100%. I still going to make my music. I'm still going to, but I'm open to being influenced. I'm open to listening. I'm open to being humble and saying, all right, people like this, I'm going to try a little bit of that in it. I don't necessarily eat on a regular but I'll show a little bit of it inside of there. And mm -hmm. sort of going and not necessarily playing their game at all because you're not playing their game. Um, you bring in something that's completely different to the table. But mm -hmm. that, that mainstream, they don't, they don't know what they want. To. No. And anybody who listening and thinking, oh, this is what they want, I'm going to get them that. You already exist in the past. When you're doing that, you're already in the past because they're looking for, for the next thing and they don't know what they're looking for. So mm -hmm. yeah. the claim to fame of a lot of people who are on radio here is not that they bring new music from outside of it, it's that they listen to outside and they're like, oh, that's, that's, that's good already outside. And then they bring it here. We have to really, really create a real strong counterculture, which we are doing and support each other as hard as we possibly can. When yeah. we do that, it really will only be a matter of time as long as we continue to link together before the world starts taking notice. One artist won't do it. Two artists won't do it. Ten artists won't do it. You know what I mean? And so this notion yeah. of the one, this notion of I go be the one, <laughs> you had to dispel that. You need, yeah. you need, you need, you need three, four hundred DJs. You need a roster of 500 artists who doing and making and creating before the world starts really turning its head and going, hey, what's going on in Trinidad? Yep. Yeah. And sometimes DJs, not just DJs, but like artists. And I see it all, the, I don't know if it's because, maybe because I'm a new DJ, it's easy for me to divert so you know and i noticed that there are the djs that play it safe there are also a lot of artists that play it safe so like mohammed said you, you you tend to sort of like you know stick to formula stick to a pattern and then wonder hey but well, i mean why my song not getting heard what because there's so many songs like that out there um so it's you know it's it's, it's a lot that's happening um so, you know, I, I think it's important, Kaz, especially for you, you know, to, you have, I think right now is a, 2021 is a time where, you know, you see in such a rise in Afrobeats music and Afrofusion and especially, you know, that's, that's 
who you are. And I think what makes musicians stand out or artists stand out is when there's that sense of authenticity, you know, mm -hmm. and then you have also have not just, you're not just authentic, but there's also an integrity too, right? Like in terms of the kind of music yeah. that you make and the kind of music that is created. And even if the radio don't want it, like you said, there are people, a lot, a lot of people mm -hmm. want what they're not getting. And yeah. I think he is just, you know, consistency in terms of what you're putting out. And, you know, you just kind of keep being you, keep doing what you have to do. And yeah, and people get it. I mean, unfortunately, I think DJs need to be a little more sensitized. Mm -hmm. um, program directors need to be a little more sensitized in terms of what is actually good music. But then, you know, the prop it, it becomes problematic too when you have artists who have like a big PR team or you have a big budget and you could throw money behind the pro program directors or the DJs that are on radio and you get your song heard, you know what I mean? But but I think more and more those things have started to become a lot more transparent. Um, so you you get, you kind of get a sense of oh, who have the bigger budget and who doesn't, but yeah. you know, that doesn't mean that your song isn't good. So I, I think what you're doing, keep doing it. I've listened to some of your music and I quite like it. I will, I will say this though. Yeah, like put, putting it into radio, like even what I said too, like is not 100% really based on my experience. Obviously, my music could get played on radio more, but there is stations that show me love now, you know, like Slam definitely show love all the time. Um, so it's more of a thing, like in my head, I really believe that radio holds an importance, but the importance is, isn't as heavy as it used to be. Um, just mainly because even me doing what I do and the music I make, like most, most of the opportunities that I, I stumble upon or I get for myself on earn, they come from outside of the country. That, that, that's something that I continuously see and as a, somewhat of a progression trait that anytime something that like somebody showing a big appreciation for what I do is mainly somebody abroad now. So when I say like, pertaining to the radios, like they definitely need to play like the, the people that I along and the people that I know very talented and don't have that fan base online or don't know how to do this stuff like what I do and what Jimmy does to really get people to see and pay attention or find things dope. Sometimes they might need that little start, you know, that little jump start. So yeah, like that's me. Neat. I'm just saying, yeah, as you say, like they need to kind of know and as you say, play other stuff, play different stuff. And and, and they, they also are the people that could pick what people like to. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I, one, I will, I will, one, I will also say this though. Like, things. if you know that your music isn't immediately non-mainstream, I mean, isn't immediately mainstream, then your your business had to be in order. Meaning, you you can't have an Instagram that you're neglecting and you're posting once a year, or you're not, you know, you're not engaging your fan base. You're making one 100%. song every six months. You're not like. Are you actively doing everything you can do as an artist? Because if you know you're beginning as a quote-unquote underdog, then you understand that you're fighting uphill, right? Mm -hmm. And are you also doing the very important work of figuring out who you are, right? Or are you just looking at the fruit now? Where you're like, hey, I want to get there and pick that fruit off of that branch up there. But at the same time, you don't even know how your yeah. own legs work. You don't know. You want to climb the tree. You don't even know. You're just putting yourself in the space with climbers, hoping that, well, maybe somebody will drag you up the tree i don't know like have all this, these ideas of people in their mind like they feel like i'm gonna put something on the internet and somebody gonna see that and then it's gonna go viral and then i'm gonna get famous that's not a plan that yeah. is not a plan wish you understand that's a wish and i wish it's not a plan you know and yeah. i think yeah and i think that's something that a lot of people have to think about sit down and listen to your music in the context of other things you don't exist as, a, as, as, as like some singularity alone, right? Even though you are that unique and you are that special, you exist in, within a context and within a timing, right? And some of the greatest artists of all time, the thing that they've done, people like Michael Jackson, is that every single song that they put out, they borrowed a little piece of what was contemporary. They mixed it into what they did and then they put it back into the world. If Michael was alive now, he'd have been making some trap 
he'd be doing some grime. He'd be doing real different, like, you know, yep. are we mixing those elements without okay. getting deep, without oh, no. ourselves getting lost in the element, right? Like, not to get lost in the element, but to tune yourself to the ears of the, of the era now. To be adaptable. Yeah. 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 That, that brings me to my next point, right? You, you mentioned something earlier where you said, you know, they don't really know what they want, the audience. And I, I think I have, an, I have a, a personal example with that. When I was, when I was younger, I remember I was in UTT and I you was know, studying pan and I, I, it was panorama time and I walked walking into the Savannah with a bunch of older panists, right? And at this time, I am still being, I'm still experiencing new types of music. And we walk into the Savannah, we hit in the drag. And I remember hearing this, hearing a band playing. I didn't know who band it was. And I heard something unfamiliar, right? And though it was unfamiliar, my initial reaction was, hey, this, this song kind of cool. Let me, let me go towards this song. But I was following yeah. the, the older men at the time. And they too went towards the song. And before I got a chance with my quiet voice to say or to voice my opinion that I like this or I kind of digging how this song is always different. It's something I never heard in a panorama. And before I got the chance to say that, instantly they were like, nah, that is not panorama. That is stripping this. That is real trash. That is nonsense. And I, my very impressionable self, I said, yeah, 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 yeah. That is stripping this. That is stripping this. That is nonsense. And for years, I didn't listen to that. It's only after, I want to say about four, five years passed, and I heard, I heard the same tune again, and it was by um, a famous panist named Andy Norell. I know what that's if it's bird song you're talking about. I it was swear I know what that's if it's bird, bird song Because they had, mm. they had uh, it was like a 6-8 section that was almost, it was like, it was like a, almost a blues, kind of a, just different. And I remember hearing it and in, liking it. But it's only years later when I heard it as uh, a musician that I grew and I matured. And I understood my style and my song. And like you said, you know, I, I got a greater sense of self. When I heard that, I was advocating. I was like, that real bad. I said, if I was a judge, that was winning. And, or, you know, getting high, much higher points. And that kind of, I think that experience for me, I never let go of that. And that really, you know, pushed me to try and understand the different stages that an artist could be in, whether it be underground or underground that trying to stay or just produce or underground that trying to get into mainstream. Because I think there are at least one to two stages where they are, okay, I want to put out something that the audience is going to invite and go with. Or I want to put out something and hope that Whoever bite it, bite it, and I get famous. And what you were saying there, I don't like either of those stages, but go ahead. <laughs> we, we, we have mentioned earlier where you know if Michael Jackson was alive today, you know, he would have been making trap and being adaptable. You know, do you think that people know or artists know, especially a lot that coming up or that have the ability to to, to produce outside of the mainstream? Do you think the mainstream itself is influencing so many artists to just play it safe and not necessarily experiment. I mean, yeah, I mean, yes. 100%. Right? 100%. Um, if, you, if you know when you go in a place, right, it have food there. No, you ain't sure to get the food there, dog. <laughs> but it having food there now, boy. <sighs> so, you know, people with a certain kind of bowl when they go there, they just get the food now. So you, you sit down and you're watching the bowl and you say, well, I'll make a bowl like this. It's not the bowl you're born with, you know. You say, I'll go just take my little crunky bowl and I'll go try to make a bowl looking like that. And you go and you stand up there with your bowl. And somebody put a little something in there and say, hey, well, like I'm getting food here. You're trying to make your bowl more and more. And the more little access you get, the more like you feel like your thing. You're trying to create your thing to be more and more to receive that food. But the yep. truth is, half the time, we're facing in a direction, looking in a direction for food. No, understanding that all you have to do is just turn your gaze a little bit and have a whole world outside here, Jen. Mm -hmm. A whole world full of all kinds of food, all kinds of people serving all kinds of shit now. But it go back to what I was saying before. Are you ready to speak to that world? Are you ready? There are many artists who want to be famous, but if Beyonce called it today to go on tour or to do something, 
you ready? People want to have certain levels of achievement, but if somebody call it up off first on a song right now, if Carl and call it and say, hey, I'm ready, I'm gonna lock in with you for, for three weeks and let me make, I need it to write, within that three weeks, we need to write a hundred songs and choose eight. You ready for that? Exactly. You know, and again, that might be what you're aiming for, but what you're aiming for and what you're asking for could often not be in alignment. They had to be real careful. Mm. I mean, hundred percent, definitely. Um, uh, so do you think is a physical space issue? Like, do we have enough venues or events to facilitate different songs or diff just different things? Like, do we think? Yeah. Or do you collectively, collectively, yeah. Or let me get, let me get uh, DJ, DJ Honey. Yeah. I just think, well, I would love to have events where it's like almost like a hashtag no English, where, you know, you just play songs that is like, you know, songs you don't hear all the time. But I mean, really and truly, it boils down to money. Um, so like you know it's not easy to just decide okay I'm gonna have an event and I want all these people to come but you know I have to I have to reach people right and that I feel like that definitely costs um yeah that definitely costs something as well as I think one of the big issues that I face currently now working with Africa Film Trinidad and Tobago doing my own event doing my own podcast is that support right and they have I, I've been told well you know the name of your podcast Afro Vibe you know it, it it excludes people that aren't black and how do you feel about that now this was from a sponsor right so I'm like well I disagree with that because you have other cultures like you know they would have cultural events that speak to their culture but it doesn't exclude anybody who's not a part of the culture but mm -hmm. it, it's also not for the person who is outside of the culture if you understand what i'm saying you know so it's yeah. it's, it's a lot of it's 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 just so many different components so many different things that you have to think about um so much fight down <laughs> for, you know, for lack of a better phrase so much fight down and it, it I mean it is it does get a little bit frustrating but I do be, I definitely believe that 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 there are people like me out there that want to have events where it's not just mainstream music you know you want to hear a cast you want to hear a free town now free town is mainstream now by the way just saying so even you know what I mean right so it's you 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 the the want there the desire is there but in terms of getting the support, in terms of, you know, just the backing, it, I think that is one of the things that is definitely keeping us back um, in terms of getting our kind of music to the world. I mean, and, and not just to the world, but to people here in Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean, right? I'll, I'll, make a, I'll make a suggestion, you know, for any artist who might be listening and even the artists who are here now. One of the things that, that we found, right, that we've discovered over the years is you see, if, if you could make your business about the community and mm -hmm. not necessarily just about you, right? So I'm not directly speaking to cars or honey here, but just in general, right? There's this idea a lot of times with artists that there's this um, individual-centric kind of thing. So the, whoever the lead singer is or whoever it is, right? Everything is focused on making that person and highlighting them as much as possible. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is, if you have a community behind you, and you can focus on the needs of that community. A sponsor might more tie into trying to understand the needs of a community and having that back in and knowing, well, you know, we could, we could look good in this way or that way, right? Because at the end of the day, sponsors want to look good. I can't yeah. fault them for that. They've been trying to just get your money just so, right? They mm -hmm. want to look good. Yeah. And you sit down and you think, how do I make you look good while making my people feel good and making everybody get good, you know? And there are ways to, to, to funnel that. There are ways to to language your events and to language your projects and thing to make sure that you don't you don't sell yourself in order to get that sponsorship and that also it doesn't just stick with you now i think a large a lot of times we get that lesson from people yeah. where we you know you see somebody trying to sell deal and then they face all over a billboard and whatever whatever but exactly. 
there are ways to approach these things that funnel the money into projects are, that benefit, you know? For sure. They are for yeah. sure. I mean, and the, trust me, Mohammed, I could send you my proposal. I could send you my write-ups and, you know, you'll teach yourself, but it's ex- no 100 agree with what you're saying um I, it, it is like i said it I, the word blackness like yes there's community in, in everything that i do right but the word black culture the word afro it makes a lot of people uncomfortable um yeah, yeah. you and know just so- not, not to cut your quote but i would also say like anybody who get offended by you being your authentic self like me me saying i am african right and somebody going, well, I feel like that excludes me from what you're doing. No, come on, come and see what I'm doing. If I tell you I'm having a, a, a barbecue and you know, you're know you hungry, come and eat barbecue. Somebody else go have a curry, whoever, but this is what I just do. Come and witness what I do. That doesn't exclude you from being a part of it. I find that language is, yeah. I find when people say that it doesn't sound, like it make no sense to me now, like. For sure. Right. So they say, well, you know, all this, all this, um, Everything that you're doing, that's for black culture, you know, you're doing it as a sort of, as a way to ostracize people who aren't black. And I, I just, like I said, I can't, I just don't understand it um, because yeah. it's, it doesn't seem to be happening in other scenarios, but this one. Um, so yeah, I mean, at this point, it's just, you know, I kind of just have to keep doing what I'm doing, what the, yep. the, regardless of the scale that it's on and yeah so so cousin I think yes I think you know I I'm definitely um on the road to having like certain experiences I should say you know for people to kind of just just see what it feels like to listen to music that you might not necessarily hear you know in a social setting like a fet where it's not necessarily soca or dancehall you know, but not to say that you're not including that in it, but it's not going to be the focus. And I think that's really important. I think we need that. And I think once we get that, I think we would start appreciating other forms of music that are being created. Taz, you were going to say something? No, nah, I was just readjusting my position real quick. <laughs> <laughs> right. Divide. But yeah, I, I'm definitely hearing you and I agree because I feel like we always are kind of tying everything over with what was said. I feel like we always have to ease the audience into things. We always have to try and just pull them in like, especially when you know the audience being a little difficult, you know, they, you, you know you're hungry, but you're watching the barbecue thinking... Mm, or whatever thought you're thinking or however you're trying to skin up your face but I feel like yeah. we as artists constantly have to ease the audience into something and an example that I could give as it relates to me is as a pan player that want to play primarily jazz and you know early calypso or some early early calypso if I tell my friends, I was like, hey, yeah, I have, or I tell general people, I have a show and we're going to play jazz. You know, the, the average young person I'm like, eh, I, ain't, I ain't trying to go and hear no, no old people music or no kind of, you know, things like that. And I would say that I had two successful shows in the past where I branded it as jazz. But what we did was, you know, we played, uh, what was this song? Fall by Davido. Mm-hmm. I went in my opinion, I was like, okay, let me find the jazz in that and say, right, I will catch you. Because the audience, as we said before, the, I think the audience, they want to try new things and they want to hear different. They want, they want to experiment. But I think there's a, a issue with the hood. When, when people in groups, they're not going to be as confident enough to say, I like this, regardless of what everybody else thinking. Mm-hmm. And that's a but it's also it's also on you as an artist if you know, like. I don't think you should be a purist when you're young, right? I don't think you should be a purist at all, right? That's my opinion. But you see, especially when you're young, right? Saying certain things and saying, "Well, I just do this or I just do that," and I'm not saying you directly, right? I just saying in general. I don't feel like when 
I don't think you should ever be a purist. I think you should always open up yourself to the possibility that what you're doing at the point in time might be working. Like I'll tell you, for us, I have written more songs in my in my time so far in the last 10 years than I care to count. And I have, and out of all those songs I've written, I can tell you that probably only 5% of them end up in the set. And right. out of that 5%, another little 2% two, 2 just end up there for like a couple of times. And then you realize, oh, nah, this is not, you know? I think a lot of people just die on the hill of ego, Judd. Yeah. Because you write, yeah. A, you, you write a song or you create a, a set or something and you're like, yeah, this is fire though. And you're there by yourself and you're going too hard and you're like, yeah, boy, this is real fire, this fire. And then you go in front of the crowd and you realize, wait, boy, you know? At that point, you have, you have two choices. You could say, people just don't understand me ahead of my time. <laughs> or, or you could try and adjust yourself now, boy, and be humble. Yeah. And it might be a bit of both, eh? It mm -hmm. might be a bit of both, but then but you have to decide. Oh, man. When you mm -hmm. say adjust, like, what do you yeah. mean by adjust? And that's where the precarious thing is, right? That, that is where it gets real tricky, right? Because yeah. the adjustment, no. The adjustment could be, let me try and be more like somebody who's more popular. Let me try and adjust myself in that way. Or your adjustment could be, I played this specific song right after this song, right? As a singer. And the energy was here. And then when I sing this, the energy real drop and I couldn't bring it back up. Why I put that song there in this set? Does it need to be there? Or is it because I feel I want people to hear that song? Have I really mastered this song? Does this mm -hmm. song, you understand? Sometimes ego will tell you, I just love this song. I don't care. I put in that song in this set. And they're like, I like it. If you don't like it, I them. Mm -hmm. Not really them, that you. You know what I mean? <laughs> and that's why I mean adjust. It's not adjusting to what is already, but adjusting within yourself to find that flow. You know what I mean? Because... All of us would know as artists, a set and the flow of a set is a kind of a mastery that you had to understand, boy. It's a kind of graph that you had to keep playing with and playing with until you get it, now, boy, you know? So that's what I mean by just... This girl boy back and... I could talk, we could talk for an hour again, but we have five minutes to wrap up. Oh, and shit. Just want to close in with saying that, you know, with all I was said here, and I, I truly enjoyed listening to... So what y'all had to say and all of y'all's perspective and it really just to tie it up for especially any younger artists or any artists in general that watching that can heed, heed the words of what was said is I think one of the main points was being adaptable and being able to understand yourself as an artist and knowing where you want to go and to be able to reach there you have to be adaptable and again, I want to thank you all for coming on to this live and sharing your thoughts and opinions. Um, if you can leave a quick sentence for, for the viewers, just any words of advice as we wrap up? My advice, uh, simply keep doing what you're doing. Um, there will be curveballs, but that's life, right? Um, I, I do believe in authenticity and being genuine um, in your art and in your craft. And I think once you have that, and once you have that level of self-awareness, I think you could be unstoppable. Of course, Rome was not built in a day. Um, so it's it, it definitely takes work. And I feel like, I, I think it's important to understand that as an artist, you have to keep producing and creating. I think that's the, the, the core definition of what being an artist is. Um, so once once you have that, I think you're well on your way to, you know, being where you want to be. And that's my two cents. <laughs> so, um, so, you want me go next? Yeah. I find I really talk. Now, <laughs> <laughs> uh, nah, well, what, what I have to say is very simple. Um, I believe that we all should, as artists, chase what we're trying to chase, but also try to put a little bit of real and realistic thinking into it also once going forward that is something will always help with emotions and help with dealing with when they don't go your way i feel like people should keep that in mind as an important thing um also build what you have now like don't think that because you only have i guess 1500 people listening at this current moment like lock into that 1500 people figure out how you can make that expand and deal with those people like focusing on too much of other other things and other people and other brands and energy.
is just gonna just keep draining you know, and have you empty you know? mm. um and yeah just build and feed them like that's the only thing we could really do as artists to the people that listen to us our mm-hmm. job is them and just keep them here and us and, and you know our point of view true music so that's my that's yeah. my two cents and we'll end with Mohammed. i would just say real quick learn adapt go back inside again adjust come out again learn adapt go back inside adjust learn adapt learn adapt yeah. don't, don't, don't ever stop adapting general don't ever stop feeling like you know and um always maintain a link with the artists around you if you put yourself in isolation then you're, you're going to end up in a space where you're not really listening and you'll create things that are not touching and you'll wonder why not and they maintain that link go and walk in the market go and walk down Frederick Street you know talk to the people around you yeah, yeah. Yes, anyways, thank you all so much and we look forward to seeing anything that you all have put out, anything releasing soon. Yeah, man. For, For sure. sure. Much love, all Take it easy. I appreciate everything that you have said and every perspective that you had lent us. Thank you to the panelists, Muhammad. Kaz and DJ Honey Collada and our conversation lead Charlton. The conversation was lively, interesting, thought-provoking. We're so grateful, actually. We're very grateful. Thank you. Before we close, we have a few readings from Leroy Clark's publication. The first is a poem number 12 from The Distance. is here read by Zaria Williams. The next is the articulation of El Tukuchian Eldership, read by Elliot Elliot. Ross Dick. And the last is a poem entitled Kamal Braffitt, read by Abdul Majid Abdul Karim. Do enjoy. Welcome to those who breached extinction. Welcome to the great breathers of lofty scriptures and their happiness, and the vast aborescence of their dreams. Welcome to a century-old prodigy, vigorous men, painted tall man to man in the sunripe skies of their beauty. Welcome. Welcome you mysterious forests of proud women, with your gentle wrath reflecting the play of the universe, your tidal vocabularies and your spectres of elegant columns reaching skyward from your African abysses. Welcome, you dark imperishable sources of human tribes, welcome to infancy, perpetually alive in your immense womb. Welcome, slender winds of a remote land with the living perfumes of new days of vintage customs, a glow in the firm round of your dark breasts. Ah, the nocturnal delights. Held closely in sacred African ceremonies, the molten air of bodies, candle flies between earth and sky in the glow of communion, at the nipples and in the auspicious cup of your navel. We kiss as we kiss, in an understanding of prophecy. How all things merge without bruising their skins? Seamlessly. How alike the eye and distances are here. Already with the first light of dawn, between night and day, catching our parting lips, new generations are arriving with defiant futures. Up, up swung torrents of new marriages to dawnings that slept a while too long in the rhapsodic conflagrations of my own blood and bones and flesh. The swollen floods of middle passage buoy my spirit forward with centurion stealth. Oh, you young curiosity, do you bedazzle petals on the forehead of new day? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Gather around our table so richly deserved and fine where all histories are resolved in the polished grain of its wood, where all storms are quieted in our arbors, enraptured still at this morning's heart 
at leisure in its unflattering sea. Welcome. Welcome, O oh fine guests, who congeal beyond endurances to link the pinnacles of thought in an addition splendidly arisen above great spaces of palpitating climates. See the blessed heights of art and reason. Consciously and subconsciously, Leroy Clark's art and aesthetic language appear to be derived from a bag of legionary suppliers, ardently fed to the ritualized, consecrated objects of the Obia man's and woman's craft, ancestral altars, shrines, and feasting table arrangements, sacrification art, weather, and masquerade art. In this context, the following description by Stephen Fuller in 1789, of the thatch roof and walls of an old woman, old African woman's house in Jamaica, as well as an assemblage of what seemed to be divin divinatory, ritualized, healing, obia objects discovered under her bed, fits well Leroy Clark's painting style and aesthetic compass. The roof and walls of this woman's house, according to Philo, st is stuck with rags, feathers, and bones of cats. Moreover, Fuller notes that a large earthen pot or jar, close covered, was found concealed under her bed. It contained a prodigious quality of round balls of earth, or clay of various dimensions, large and small, whitened on the outside, and variously compounded, some with hair and rags and feathers of all sorts, and strongly bound with twine. Others blended with the upper section of the skulls of cats, or stuck round with cat teeth and or claws, or with human or dog's teeth, and some glass beads of different colors. There were a great deal of many eggshells filled with a viscous or gummy substance, and many little bags stuffed with a variety of articles. The Voodoo and Santeria, Lukimi and Mayube altars and revival, Kumfa and Orisha shrines and feasting tables are similar in, in style and aesthetic principles. They are an artistically arranged display of a constellation of ritualized objects and foods to the ancestors and ancestral gods and reflect the reciprocal relationship between the world of the living and the spirit world. Leroy Clark's art replaces the ritualized, consecrated assemblage of objects with a constellation of colors, lines, and dots in a modernist aesthetic interpretation of ancestral aestheticism and art. The revered elder of Guyanese art, Philip Moore, Emmanuel Kweku Moji, and the late Cuban master, Wilfredo Lam, like Leroy Clark, produce art within this ancestral aesthetic tradition. Kamau Brafit, that Bongo man, Kamau Braf, leaping ahead the original earth, drumming lips of black waves, and conquered in surrendered loins. Here, unleashed, is a hunger. Not for reciprocity, nor is there room. Nostalgia does not dare enter. Them, drive too fast, too slow, them. I know in the end of the day is what I say, altercations with time and place. Remain unmapped, off-beaten tracks. Frequencies perched on thorns. Cocks throw stones from smeared corrugations. 
lift their hands like hot branding irons to a rising sun that chronicles birth among earthquakes to find their way through far-fetched solitaries, trotting a terse ashen continent attrition bound. Its gossip of strewn rivers course this circuit, words of besieged names, mongrel shades of ancestry, broken spirits of woody trees, shadow pantomimes, armless shreds of devoured flesh, dirt odorless armpit wounds, teeth in clogged raving wounds, clamor of softened bells wailing, fallacies adrift, disaffection of origins makes priceless sculptures of vomit words thrown. Bones the skeletal dogs grazing on their last muzzle of artless dread, scorched flesh, a pining countenance throbs. Voyages unfurl their lot of chewed horizons. Hands reach their limits in hourglass skies. Tongues spit at fires, thirst black songs, black lightning rife among smoking branches. Night sticks unlock the kidneys of a hair curly smoker. Pistol like cinders pain older than shit. Older than tongues in the wheel of us, the salt ground swell stirred by the oars of dream. Tall and taller, dark and darker, yes to features on mahogany ridges, ra, ba, ka, mao, words raking the forest blind. Syntax with cracked ankles, angling with hunting arms, shaft in the mulch, soul stretching underground, consonants like them goat skins horn to us in our hope further than heaven. And after this tumid pass, too many bleed these toeless foreheads, shocked with heat, suns also weep, emptying hurt. Salted glitter of sand, mixed with blood, tear the marrow of the tongue to a bleach stained lie. Language chain the scents of cassava cooked shins that the brook that the wind brings, shattered gods bring omen. Stools lift their fags from dirt habit, further scorched by impersonal stairs. His version of carved ivory tongues, voluptuary tongues of timelessness perched on red vowel of black, gold, green, yellows, his knowledge, his nam total, just so now, rising, Kamau, one of them idle brothers who had grace. Kamau is Obia. Obia ring the word, careful to pun text texturing. Racking castrations, clattering ruins of spit and cut words, can't sleep well words, walking. Benign, raw, lost, scattered root words, reggae calypso and jazz root words. Spirit of lives made visible as fire, organic as water, physical, pompous as merchants, landlords, constable on the beat. Those who build houses from bones. A thigh from Miles, the eye from Malcolm, a prayer from Martin, no joke from Garvey, a kiss from Whitney and another from Miriam. All big up ping pong pounding past, gossiping mud up past the wearying hill laughter breaks the earth. Open stony, yucca bush bamboo trash narrow, wasted echoes, fire of street talk, camouflage, painted visibility, columns, crystal pyramids, reverberations. Want to solar those two timing lips of hiss hissing Tory and multitudes of bitches who send them ital entered to the hangover man ashen with time. We papa ow, we mama ow, come ow, do it wow right. The well overstanding of molten bronze where drunken and fattened grandmasters drank rivers hot, hot, hot in the need of laughter, fire, water. Mounted drum thundering protean futures built by the rendering hands. Close nations, legacies making children between clothes of silent fragrances, breasts of doves, images of full breath, love, images of breathful love known to the earth awakened, secret minds of noble proportions, abundance of inextinguishable springs nourishing the world uncapped. The human hearts flowing. Da man go. Da man dingo man. Come out, brah. Da eh. Eh. Da da yeah. Thank you again to all of our panelists and our conversation leads who took time out of their lives to be a part of our festival today. Thank you to our participants, most importantly, and contestants who engage very enthusiastically today with the competitive spirits they have. 
thank you to all our artists, poets, readers, hosts who allowed us to use their content today. Thank you to our partner, Leroy Clark, DL Tuchion Foundation for his fantastic publications and support. For more information on his sale of books and portfolios, visit their website, LeroyClark.com or social media, Instagram and Facebook, Leroy Clark, House of El Tutuch, and say not again, Leroy Clark, House of El Tutuch, and or you could call or WhatsApp 868 745 5150. Again, that's 868 745 5150. You can also visit an exhibition in honor of Master Artist Leroy Clark's held by the National Library and Information System Authority. You can RSVP at 623-2493. 623-2493. Thank you to the Rain Tree Plant and Wellness Center for sponsorship of our prizes in our game show. Thank you to our volunteers and public support. Thank you. Thank you to the director. Thank you to the festival director, Erica Ashton, and the content and communication director, Sean Samad of the Black Country, Sean Samad of the Black Consciousness Festival, to our youth director and coordinator, Jenny Cunningham, and to the youth team, and to create future good for this space, which, to, which we hosted today's activities. And most importantly, thank you to the audience of the festival for tuning in with us throughout the entire day. We are so grateful for your presence. Though this is the end of the festival, we continue this tradition of celebration and recognition of our beautiful legacy. The International Day of Remembrance of the Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade, celebrated on the 25th of March, offers the opportunity to honor and remember those who have suffered and died at the hands of the brutal slavery system. The International Day, also aims to raise awareness about the dangers of racism and prejudice today. And this idea is echoed throughout, that was echoed throughout all our, our activities. All right, so for more information on the Black Consciousness Festival, you could visit our website at www.theblackconsciousnessfestival.com and various social media, the Black Consciousness Festival. And remember, and remember walk, walk in pride, pride power, power, and practice. practice.